Okay, good morning. I'm Carlo De Rito. I'm a PhD student at the University of Parma in Italy. And today I'll delve into the fascinating, at least for me, concept of gene duplication and neofunctionalization in vertebrate evolution. Okay. I'm sorry, I can see my slide change it's on, on the screen. Okay, you can see it. And sorry, I can't move from, sorry. Start the presentation mode, but it can, can go for it. So I can, this, but I can go. I'm sorry. Sorry. <laughs> okay, so. so let me try, should work now. No. Can we try to close and reopen? Maybe? Uh. Try to close and reopen, maybe? Yeah, yeah, maybe you try to close and reopen. Okay, it should work. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry again. To start, let's understand gene duplication. So it occurs when a gene is replicated and the new copy can undergo various changes. It can lose its function retain the ancestral function, or even acquire a new function. So, um, let's uh, start, for instance, let's consider the um, new functionalization of the cystation in beta synthesis gene in sauropsida. In this process, the ancestral copy loses its ancestral function and becomes a lyase. So we wondered um, how many of the such cases we can found in, um, in null vertebrates. And to achieve this, we developed a large-scale automatic procedure consisting of two steps. The identification of tandem gene duplications and identification of new functionalization signals through sequence alignment analysis and neural networks. So for our study, we collected coding sequences from the entire human genome. Using an intraspecies BLASP, we determined homology. And after this, we employed the DBSCAN cluster algorithm and chromosomal coordinates to group homologous gene. Specifically, we focused on, mm, on uh, tandem array genes, tags, which are groups of homologous genes spaced by less than 10 non-homologous genes and containing at least one best reciprocal hit pair. So um, our dataset included a total of 1073 uh, tags of varying sizes, mm, as shown in the graph, where they are sorted according to the chromosomes they belong to. So the largest tag is the one on chromosome two, containing 76 tandem duplicated genes. And the chromosome on which we found the many duplications was the chromosome 19. But for simplicity, we focused on those uh, with sides two. So using ensemble compara, we conducted an orthology analysis uh, for each gene pair. And we searched for orthologs in um, mammalia sauropsida, and fishes. So in this case, the pair results duplicated in all organisms, as you can see by looking at the colors. This other pair, on the other hand, would lead us to think of a more recent duplication, considering that we find it only in mammals, the red pairs. So in um, the resulting heat map illustrates the presence or absence uh, of orthologs for each species. Uh, with each column representing a two-sides tag. In blue, okay, you can see the duplications preserved in the respective species. In red, the presence of only one, one orthologue of the two, 
invite the absence of orthologs. So moving from left to right in the heat map, we encounter gradually more recent duplications, less and less present in the three vertebrate classes. Um, up to those exclusive to Homo sapiens. You can follow the, the full blue line in the, in the center. So um, next, we aligned all the, the sequences we obtained from the ortho group pairs, discarding those that didn't meet a coverage threshold. And in this, um, in this figure, we can um, see the alignment of a two sides tag with red, the sequence in red on the left, representing the orthologs from gene A the red box, and black representing the orthologs from Gene B, the black box. So to um, assess the preservation of differences between groups, we assign partial and total scores to each position in the alignment, everything based on a Blossom 62. For example, a conserved G in all sequences um, has, a, has a conservation score of six, and uh, a non-conserved D uh, fails to achieve the same score of six, as you can see with the N inside. So we use this score. Um, this scores enabled us to calculate a different score, reflecting the conservation of differences between groups. And um, we repeated this process for all duplicate gene pairs, resulting in a data set with scores and if scores for each position, for each pair. So in this plot, you can see um, all the pairs sorted by um, according to their residues above the threshold per 100 residues. And we can see that we found cases that had even more 25 residues above the cutoff per 100 residues. In this other plot, the same uh, positions and score as shown before in relation to the Uniprot features on the left, we can see mut positions, mutations referring to positions, uh, to point positions, sorry. On the right, mutations that we have detected within ranges. We can, we can identify informative features uh, such as active site, binding site, and mutagenesis sites, as well as less informative for us, for our case, features like general sites, chains, and repeats. So we wondered how many of the 296 pairs are, are already have a known function in literature. And taking advantage of a manual curation and the use of resource, resources such as Uniprot features, as we saw in the previous plot, go annotations and CAG pathways, we identified 99 pairs as neo-functionalized, 86 as not neo-functionalized, and the rest too, due to lack of annotations as maybe. For example, ART5 and ART1 are both annotated as ribosyl, ribosyl transferases, but ART1 exhibits more, more glycodrolase activity due to specific mutations that we found in positions annotated as signal peptide active and binding sites. Um, other mutations were identified at the level of the GPI anchor. In fact, ART5 is found secreted as opposite to ART1 uh, that we found it, um, that we can find it at level of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So, um, to predict the new functionalization phenomena, we trained a neural network using multiple sources of information, um, including a multiple sequence alignment, um, the diff scores we saw before, and the 3D structures. So let's consider AOC2 and AOC3 as, as another example. Both are amino oxidases, but AOC2, retina specific, exhibits a clear preference for, um, for aromatic amines, while AOC3 prefer aliphatic amines, amines, sorry. The positions we found in the alignment of AOC2 and AOC3, which exhibited an IDF score, are the key residues um, responsible for the observed change in substrate preference. So let's consider the structures. Uh, the first oxidase is shown in red, while the second one is shown in blue, and the active side pocket is highlighted as grid. Okay. So let's color the residue within the pockets. So red for the residues we found associated with an IDF score 
yellow for the active site residues, and blue for the binding site ones. We can see that we, mm, the active site residues in, the, in yellow are conserved, but the neighboring residues uh, have undergone mutations. So by considering the hindrance of the mutated residues in blue, we can clearly understand the reason for the different substrate preference. So based on the same principle we have just seen, and to ensure an unbiased analysis, we collected all alpha fold structures, even in the presence of PDB structures. And for, for each of those, we calculated the distance between each amino acid and the loaders, creating a distance matrix. And on those, we applied a cutoff of 12 angstroms to uh, generate a contact map. In addition to those maps, we um, constructed conservation score map and a difference score map, as you can see on the third column. And at each location is the minimum score of two positions in the structures. Thus, a lead point in the difference score map indicates that both positions have an IDF score. And that means that the positions are both differentially conserved in gene A and gene B. On the other hand, a bright dot in the conservation map indicates that the two positions are conserved in both genes. So, all these maps were used to create a consensus one in which we can see um, the combination of the crucial information of the previous maps. And the darker blue dot represent um, a point of contact between the two structures associated with an IDF score surrounded by five pixel score contour obtained from the conservation score map. Each of these squares um, can potentially represent the spatial situation we saw for the two oxidases. So we also computed embeddings for uh, all sequences in our alignments using an ex-Facebook research neural network model trained on 250 million sequences. Mm, my, I will uh, I avoid to get into it because you just talked, but um, an embedding transforms each amino acid into an unique 1024 number vector considering the semantic context in which the amino acid is found. And, but given the huge amount of data in these matrices and um, the different distribution in terms of the number of aligned sequences, uh, we provide the network with only the um, embedding from the human sequences of the alignment. So our network consists of a convolutional neural network for image classification and a recurrent one for sequence classification. The world can be considered as two separate network, uh, one only convolutional for images and one convolutional and recurrent for uh, sequences, which converge in the final portion into a dense layer followed by two, two, dense, two neurons for predictions. So to ensure robustness and considering the limited, the limited number of examples, we employed a five-fold cross-validation approach, dividing our dataset into five-fold and used for fold for mm, training the network and one for making predictions, resulting in loss values that tells us how far the predictions are from the targets and an accuracy value. So repeating this operation five times with each fold serving as the prediction set provided us with a comprehensive evaluation of the network's performance. The resulting mean, the resulting mean accuracy was 0 0.85 and the mean accuracy of four iteration of five-fold cross-validation was 0 0.83. So we uh, also investigated in this plot whether, whether the networks already relied on score differences or if they detected specific patterns. However, upon examining the score distribution of the yes and no sets, um, they seem quite overlapping. So we... Um, in this plot, we evaluated our neural network with the um, raw course, which show its performance in predicting neo functionalization. Each false through positive rate and false positive rate were calculated at various um, probability thresholds, resulting in those five curves. The resulting area under the curve, the mean, 
was 0 0.87. So for each individual example, the network outputs a probability value. Uh, value of one indicates an high likelihood of new functionalization, while zero the opposite. Looking at mm, these box plots, we note that the model predictions have uncertainties on the final segments. And um, this is probably due to net network generalization error or um, incorrect manual annotations. However, in all other cases, the predictions remain consistent. So in addition to the pre previously discussed example, I would like to present a third case that we find particularly remarkable, the DPEP2 and DPEP3, the third one on the right. Um, because the new functionalization is attributed to only three residues uh, that are directly involved in the substrate binding. The other, the other part remain uh, conserved. So, in conclusion, we retrieved by homology analysis 1073 clusters of homologous genes arranged in tandem. Of these, 296 were of sites 2. We identified 99 as yes and 86 as no. And by um, aligning these pairs with their respective orthologs, we obtained the different scores later used with the structures and sequence embedding of the MSAs. And um, we've had this data, obviously, sorry, <laughs> to predict new functionalization phenomena, obtaining good results, looking at known examples, and accuracy, loss, and AUC values. Mm. Moving forward, our future research will involve expanding the data set through automatic annotation methods, incorporating spatial information into the network architecture, and experimentally validating a predicted gene pair and so I would like to thank my research group, particularly my supervisor, Professor Riccardo Percudani, my colleague Marco Malatesta, and the other of the team, Giulia Sassi, and the other. So, um, and you for your attention. Thank you. Thanks for a very interesting talk. Uh, did, did you try to categorize the types of new functionalization so? I mean, you, I mean, you gave us three examples, but like, is it any or, I, mean, I guess it's rare that you change from one and some activity to another one. It's more like subcell localizations or so what, what, what type of functional change did you, did you see in overall? It, uh, we know that there are very uh, different cases to each other. So um, in terms of function, in terms of patterns, pattern in per se. Um, maybe um, they are very different. So localization in terms of function, binding, mm, different substrate, or uh, yes, we can see very, uh, <laughs> so, yeah.